Good morning. For me, it's morning. You'll see me drinking coffee. How is everyone? We are about to dive into the actual chapters of the Lotus Sutra. And I had a thought this morning I wanted to share with you before we dive right in. And it's about our practice of Buddhism. And you, as you know, in my school, the Threefold Lotus Kuhn School of Quantum Life Buddhism, we practice uh, Nichiren scholarship all the way back through to Shakyamuni himself. I'm very much a purist. I want to know what Shakyamuni meant exactly in his sermons. The only clue we have to his sermons are the writings that were created of those sermons afterward. Um, we have a lot of confidence in the scholarship of Buddhism because uh, the memorization that took place was phenomenal. The repetition every day, all day long, of uh, the same sermons for years and years. So when it came time to put things down into writing, uh, the foremost memorized uh, memorizers of the time were assembled to compare notes and put together each sermon in writing. But beyond that, I don't want to talk too much about that because I've talked about that before. And there's lots out there about it. Um... And there's a lot of trolling, like there is in other stuff, people who want to discredit everything. But here's the thing, is you just can't do that with the, with the Buddhist teachings, because no matter where you start, eventually, if you're assiduous, if you're diligent, if you read everything, which is what he told his followers to do, um, the, the, the essence, the meaning, the truth, if you will, it just comes through. Case in point, um, I have, you know, this is one version of the Lotus Sutra I have by H. Kern from the late 1800s. And uh, I'll show you uh, it, how thick it is. It's, uh, you know, in the typeset, uh, it's uh, not that small. It's, it's your regular typeset. Um, and it's how many pages? 207 pages. This is a modern translation uh, in the 2000s, okay? And <laughs> and it's not because it's big old people script. It's maybe it's slightly larger, but not much. Um, the reason I show you this is because uh, I probably have at least a dozen different translations of the sutra around here. Uh, and people ask me all the time, you know, what good is chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo? Which we're going to do right now, Sancho. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. So what is that? What's that about? Well, I have videos about it, so I'm not going to go in depth. But I bring it up because if I say to anyone, but uh, probably mostly Americans because it's part of or was part of public school programs, if I say to kill a mockingbird um, or Huckleberry Finn, I don't even have to say the title of the book, The Adventures of Huck Finn or Huckleberry Finn or Mark Twain. Immediately, whatever you know about Huckleberry Finn will come to mind. Now, you may know very little about Huck Finn, but you will know something. Um, you may be an authority on Huckleberry Finn. You may not only know Huck Finn was a little boy who whitewashed the fence, but you may understand much more in-depth lessons of that entire novel. Some of which don't have to do with Huckleberry Finn at all, but 
his time period, his people, the, 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 the culture, blah, blah, blah. And you'll understand the minute you hear Huck Finn, Huckleberry Finn, however I say it, zip, blah, 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 all of that knowledge just comes, boom, right to your mind. So, when, and you'll hear it repeatedly, as you already have in the Innumerable Meanings Sutra, um, but you'll certainly hear it within the Lotus Sutra, and this is one of the reasons that uh, the scholarship of the Innumerable Meanings Sutra is pretty confident about saying that it's the opening of the Lotus Sutra, because the rhetoric... The actual statements, it's almost lifted out of the Lotus Sutra. It's not like some weird document that was created somewhere and they just glued them together by association. This is very strong evidence from within the text that mm, it's an introduction, it's an opening, it's a preparation, as we've already talked about. Um, we don't have that with Huckleberry Finn unless you want unless you're a real authoritative person uh with regard to Huck Finn and its creator and so forth. You may look at previous writings of uh uh Mr. Clement and say, yeah, they were kind of ovations to his opus Huckleberry Finn, or you may not even think Huckleberry Finn is that great of one of his books. All levels of meaning and understanding come from study. So you'll hear it throughout the Lotus as you did in the opening sutra. Read, recite, write down, copy, share. The more you immerse yourself in this teaching, the more you immerse your life, your mind, into the knowledge within the teaching so that when you chant just one single phrase like Nyoho Renge Kyo, the title of the very book, the title of each chapter of the book, you will invoke your mind of knowledge and that will include the depth of meaning you cultivate from what? Yeah, I hear some of you saying the depth of meaning you, you, you cultivate from chanting. Yes. But the kind of knowledge we gain from chanting, that, that, uh, communion, uh, with our Buddha mind is nonverbal. It's an, it's an experiential learning. But we live in samsara. And so if you study and read and reread, as I have the several different translations, um, no matter how different scholars have interpreted the, the script and from different areas of whether it's India or China, we get a lot of from a translation from China or Japan. Um, The depth of meaning just keeps coming through from various different angles. Remember, innumerable meanings. The same text ha can be approached and understood in innumerable ways or immeasurable ways or, or incalculable ways, whatever expletive you want to use, basically, we all are not only going to see it different as different human beings, but every time we read it, every time we invoke the title, every time we sit in front of Gohanzen, every time we contemplate these teachings, something new will participate in our understanding. Because every moment is different. And we'll have a new sets of paradigms, new sets of information, new sets of knowledge. You know, you should sleep overnight have dreams you don't even remember and the next morning understand things that happened the previous day with much greater depth 
less distraction. That's the way the human mind works. So attaining Buddhahood isn't about leaving the human mind entirely. It's not about leaving this life. It's not about not being here. It's not, uh, what's the word, nihilistic. It's about understanding the difference. Being objective about something doesn't annihilate the something. It allows you to contemplate it without influence. No emotion. No no uh, attachments. That's what this is all about. Just see it for the glory that it is. And the more filters you get out of the way, the more clearly you see it. So yes, we chant. We commune with our Buddha mind. We get better and better at communing with our Buddha mind. But that's experiential. That is very mind-blowing. That changes you. the moment you stop chanting and you look around. Or you chant and you look around. The world is different. Not because the world changed, but because your mind has changed. Now, add to that an intellectual understanding in your human mind about what's going on here. Now, that becomes something useful in your daily life. How to watch yourself behave with others. What it means that you feel certain things from some and not from others. Or just that you feel differently from one to another. Watch that. See how that's working. Having that awareness, hugely powerful. And it only comes from the skill of observation, perception. This is what we do when we practice Buddhism. So, back to my example. If you never read Huckleberry Finn, you'll have some kind of idea, every time you hear that name, of what it might mean. But let's say you read the hardcover original print and then you go read a paperback and you can discern the little differences but basically the same story and every now and again say every six months or two years or whatever you pick up the book and you read it again and you go, ah i never noticed that before because your life has changed your mind has grown you have new information and you will apply it to the same text with different understandings. This is why study is so, so important to your Buddhist practice. Don't let any group or, or, or sangha or, or organization tell you, this is the book you read, this is the only book you read, this is how to read it, and this is what it means. Run from that. That is not Buddhism. And as you might hear in my voice, I'm very strict about that. Because I've been there. I've been in those cults. And they are cults. Even though they are bringing Buddhism to you, and in a way they need to be lauded because the spread of Buddhism is super, super important. But as Nietzschean would say, they really position themselves as enemies of Buddhism because they're turning away so many people who get fed up with that browbeating and, and brainwashing. And like, and then they, those people think Buddhism, it's a hoax, a bunch of crap. Those are people that blah, 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 they have all kinds of damaging things to say, horrible things to say. Even if you, if you don't understand what a terrible PR problem that is for the spread of Buddhism, understand it individually as, oh my goodness, look at the causes that person is making. They're not even aware of how damaging they're being to their own life and happiness, creating suffering. So please, do as Shakyamuni exhorted all of his followers to do, and actually strictly put them through a regimen of self-learning, of self-teaching, of constant study. And actually, in the Lotus Sutra, we're going to get, the second chapter is going to make this, drive this point home, 
really, really strongly the skillful means chapter. So, without further ado, how about we just jump right into it? So the first chapter of the Lotus Sutra, now that we've read the chapters of the Innumerable Mimi Sutra and we're prepared and we already know how we're going to approach this and how we're going to hear it, don't worry, I'll remind you. The first chapter is titled, big surprise, Introduction. <laughs> I believe even in H. Kearns, and I've got it sitting here handy just so we can compare things sometimes. Uh, the f chapter one is called Introductory. See, the, the difference in translation is kind of personal, right? This is what I heard. Whereas in the 1800s translation, thus have I heard. You could argue there's subtle differences there, but I would say that they're colloquial, cultural, and not do not affect the meaning but i'll leave that to you at one time the buddha was staying at rajagriha on holy eagle peak now you'll notice different translations will say eagle peak uh, vulture peak um, i think those are the only two variations i've heard i know that uh, groups like when they're when they're trying to cultivate Americans into um, the practice of Buddhism, they s totally stay with Eagle Peak. Well, why would they do that? <laughs> America is the national bird of the United States, and Canadians, uh, you know, they're going to they got probably more eagles up there than anywhere else. They see it as a majestic bird. Most of the West does. So the, the translation is going to say Eagle Peak. But if you look at older translations uh, from Britain, British scholars, who weren't so hung up about the Eagle particularly, they all call it Vulture Peak. And then you think about, well, Vulture, we, immediately in the West, uh, especially in North America, we think of the Vulture as a dirty, ugly bird. But they're actually huge, graceful, beautiful birds, and they perform, I don't know why my nose feels like there's wandering hairs on it, but I apologize. But the vulture is really a grand bird, and if you think about India and its population and the way it it's, uh, manages its waste product from food to people to everything else i mean india is a harsh place i would imagine vultures are rather prominent and they were probably greatly respected because they restore hygiene getting rid of carrion and so on and so forth so it's not hard for me to imagine that the vulture actually would hold quite a respected place in indian society especially you know almost three thousand years ago so, enough on that, but you may have noticed. With a large group of great monks, 12,000 in all, all of them were arhats without faults, free from afflictions, self-developed, emancipated from all bonds of existence, and mentally free. And we've talked about all of this at length, and obviously, here we go again. We're going to introduce you to the mental setting of this sermon. So everybody who knows anything at any level is in attendance. All ye pay attention. Okay. Um, they included. So here comes the guest list. You know, it's just like a Hollywood party. You got to know who's there. or It's not really an important party. They included Ajnata Kaudinya Maha Kashyapa uh, Uru Vilva Kashyapa Gaya Kashyapa, Nid, Nadi Kashyapa, Shariputra, Mahamaga Yayana, Maha Katyayana, Aniruda, Kapihina, Ga, Gavapati, Revata, Pirindavasa, 
Bakula, ma, anyway, goes on and on and on and on. And, uh, Mayatrani, uh, Subhuti, Ananda, Rahula, Ananda and Rahula are always there. Ananda being the Buddha's cousin, uh, was attending him for his entire life. Rahula being Shakyamuni's son. Um, such great arhats are all well known to everyone. In addition, there were 2,000 others some in training and some no longer in training. The nun Maha Prajapati was there with 6,000 followers and the nun Yashodara, the mother of Rahula, with her followers. Well, if she was the mother of Rahula, guess what? She was the husband of Siddhartha Gautama. But because now Siddhartha Gautama doesn't really exist anymore, he's transmigrated into uh the the great saint from the shakya clan shakya muni buddha being the state he has attained uh they don't refer to her as wife of the buddha they refer to her as the mother of rahula it's, it's a subtle thing but there it is uh, there were 80,000 bodhisattvas, great ones, all free from backsliding in the pursuit of supreme awakening. You know, whenever they talk about 80,000 bodhisattvas, as they did in the innumerable meaning sutra, you see where there's just this back and forth between the two sutras. That's why it's obvious that they belong together. The 80,000 are something that will be discussed later in the Lotus Sutra at great length because they are us. We are the bodhisattvas of the earth. That's us. We are the bodhisattva who spring forth from the earth, not from the Jupiter, not from the Neptune, not from the a faraway galaxy, not from, you know, the background radiation, but from the earth. Ship. Earth. All of them had mastered incantations, taught with delight and eloquence, had turned the irreversible Dharma wheel, made offerings to countless hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, planted many roots of virtue, and were always being praised by Buddhas. Having trained themselves in compassion, they could enter into Buddha wisdom, deeply understand great wisdom, and reach the other shore. Their fame had spread to innumerable worlds, and they were able to liberate innumerable hundreds of thousands of living beings. This all sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Again, it's an introduction. So, we just went through a preparation in innumerable meanings, and now we're in it, but we're getting an introduction all the same, albeit with a preparation of state of mind. They included Manjushri Bodhisattva, regarder of the cries of the world Bodhisattva, great strength Bodhisattva, constant effort Bodhisattva, never resting Bodhisattva, jeweled palm Bodhisattva, medicine king Bodhisattva, bold alms giver Bodhisattva, jeweled moon Bodhisattva, moonlight Bodhisattva, full moon Bodhisattva. This is starting to sound like the Adatamsaka Sutra, where every single aspect of mental cognition was represented by a bodhisattva or some great god or demon or whatever. Um, this device is used all throughout uh, Shakyamuni's teachings, but it is a device, and we're going to find out about that in chapter 2. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, because all of these people he's talking about, or these, I shouldn't even call them people, but these mental states, he is going to elucidate in the Lotus Sutra. <clears throat> In further chapters, I should say. Also, there at that time were Indra, king of the gods, with his followers, and 20,000 children of heaven, plus the children of heaven, rare moon, universal fragrance, jewel light, on and on we go. This is for every single aspect of human existence, experience. That's what all of this is about. In addition, there were there were four Chimera kings. And, uh, these are changing anyway. These are all, as I said, these are all personage, personages created or invoked to include every 
possible mental state. Former Griffin Kings, King Ajutsuhara. Each prostrated themselves at the Buddha's feet and then withdrew and sat to one side. At that time, the world honored one surrounded by the four groups was given offerings, re revered, honored, and praised. For the sake of all Bodhisattva, he taught the great vehicle sutra called Innumerable Meanings, the Dharma by which Bodhisattvas are taught and by which Buddhas watch over and keep always in mind. Now, there's a direct reference to the innumerable meanings. I'm curious if in the 1800s, uh, H. Kern made that kind of a mention. Nope. I don't see any mention of the uh, opening or innumerable sutras. So, you see, these are the kind of things that the modern scholarship introduces into translations in order to smooth the transitions between things uh, to help the student learn. Not sure how I feel about that. But uh, as I'm reading Curran's translation, it's very much more glued to the formal method. Um, not to say that it's different in terms of meaning, um, but Yeah, there's no reference to previous opening teachings. Anyway, maybe I think I've read some of this book in previous videos anyway, so you'll be familiar with the rhetoric or get it for yourself. I just found it interesting is that I don't I have never remembered the Lotus in any other translation being explicit about the uh, innumerable meanings sutra. So this is the first I've seen it. Uh, da, 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 in addition for okay. Having taught this sutra, sitting cross legged, the Buddha entered the state of concentration called the place of innumerable meanings, in which his body and mind were completely motionless. Now what it's called is samadhi. So the author is saying, is equating when you hear and you read about samadhi what what the innumerable meanings taught us is that that is samadhi, is innumerable meanings, because there is no finite understanding. It's an understanding that transcends momentary descriptions and uh, describes being in that mental space where all of it uh, becomes realized, experienced, and seeing that defies words. So they, this author's gone ahead and used innumerable meanings rather than a complex word that Westerners wouldn't understand called samadhi. But I think it's important to understand that that's what's happening. So that's why I'm saying it. Then Mandava, Mandarava, Great Mandarava, Manjushaka, and Great Manjushaka flowers rained down from the sky on the Buddha and the entire assembly while the whole Buddha world trembled and shook in six ways. Well, that's formal standard, right? Then the whole congregation, monks, nuns, laymen, laymen, gods, dragons, satyrs, so on and so forth, uh, astonished because this had never happened before, uh, with palms together and with complete attention, joyously looked up at the Buddha. From the tuft of white hair between his eyebrows, one of his characteristic features, the Buddha emitted a beam of light, illuminating 18,000 worlds in the East 
so that there was nowhere that he did not reach, down to the lowest purgatory and up to the Akanishta, <coughs> the, uh, the highest heaven. In those worlds, all the living beings in the six states could be seen. Likewise, the Buddha existing at present in those lands could be seen, and the sutras teaching those Buddhas preaching um, were preaching could be heard. Monks and nuns, laywomen, laymen, who had attained the way through practice could also be seen. Further, one could see bodhisattvas, the great ones, walking the, uh, the bodhisattvas, the Bodhisattva way, due to various causes and conditions, with various degrees of uh, dedication and understanding, conviction, and in various forms. Likewise, Buddhas who had entered complete nirvana could be seen, and one could see their stupas made of seven precious material stupas that had been built to hold the remains of these Buddhas after they had entered complete nirvana. Then Maitreya Bodhisattva thought, okay, now we're finally going to get, now that we've had the setting, we're finally going to get the pertinent thoughts of this sermon, okay? Now the world-honored one has displayed a marvelous sign, but what is the cause or reason for this auspicious sign? Now that the Buddha, the world-honored one, has entered into concentration, Samadhi. Whom can I ask about such inconceivable and unprecedented wonders, and who will be able to answer? Then he thought, here is Manjushri, the son of the Dharma king, who has been in close contact with and made offerings to innumerable Buddhas in the past. Surely he must already have witnessed such rare signs as these. I will ask him. Then the monks and nuns and laywomen and laymen and all the gods, dragons, demons, and blah, 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 they all thought at the same time, Whom shall we ask about this shining spiritual sign from the Buddha? Then Maitreya Bodhisattva, wanting to resolve his own doubts and seeing what was on the minds of the four groups of the assembly, the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, as well as the gods, dragons, demons, ask Manjushri, what is the reason for this auspicious and spiritual sign emitting such a great bright beam of light, illuminating the 18,000 eastern lands, revealing in detail the splendor of all those Buddha worlds? Then Maitreya Bodhisattva, wanting to say what he meant once again, asked in verse, <clears throat> Now, in all modern translations, I've seen these verses translated. They look like uh, stanzas of a, of a poem, right? And that's how we tend to read them. From the tuft of his white hair between his eyebrows, why does our leader and teacher radiate so great a light in all directions? The rain of Man Mandarava and Mandarava Mandarshaka flowers and fragrant breezes of sandalwood delight us. It's a lot. All of this prose just basically repeats the, that whole earlier ovation about who is there. I also see Bodhisattvas. It's just a total repetition of what we were just told. But this is the formal, this is the form of the teachings. Now, I want you to notice in Curran's translation, all of these uh, stanzas, if you will, they're all just interpreted as like line items. They're not written in prose. They're discussed in prose. There's some there's some rhyming going on and so forth, and I don't doubt any of that. But again, as we'll learn in the next chapter, this was skillful means. This was Shakyamuni teaching in a way that there would be a rhythm to the repetition of what he was saying, and it would make it easier to memorize. Ah, that's why there's so much repetition in three dozen different ways. It's to get the point firmly ensconced in your mind. Remember, all of this is about mental training. Okay? 
And I'm going to keep bringing you back to that, kids, because it's easy to get lost in all this rhetoric. And, and wow, what kind of flowers were those? And I, just understand that this is a very beautiful place, a quiescent space of sorts where the mind can exist and experience like a dream, a safe, learning, absorbing space that has great significance. This is the point. For instance, what I just read, why Manjushri does this ray darted by the guide of men shine forth from between his brows, this single ray issuing from the circle of hair, and why this abundant rain of mandaravas? You see that? In one sentence, Kern has captured the exact same thing in a slightly different form. In, in, I like this version simply because, and maybe it's because I've read all the other versions first, but when I, when I got this version, I found it online, I downloaded it, uh, cause it was out of print, it may be in print now. This is the cover I put on it, so, um, but this is, this is how you might look it up online. Okay. Uh, I encourage you to read it if, uh, because all of you, if you're following me, you're students and you appreciate, um, as much, uh, backup, if you will. Uh, to understanding this stuff. Uh, the H. Kern translation, because it is so direct, even though that language is a little, I don't know, I don't want to say it's flowery, but it's more, it's an old English kind of translation of a text that, you know, Sanskrit and Pali, uh, they were verbal texts. They were uh, how you said something with intonations and sounds and so forth were far more important than actual words. So to interpret that into a, a formal language like English um, is no easy task. And the way it's interpreted in Curran's version just seems to have a, a smacks of more authenticity. Whereas this really readable Western version it's a little bit colored by opinion. It seems more obvious. Not that that's a bad thing, but um, again, I'm kind of a purist. I like to make my own opinion of uh, what was meant by certain word usages and phrasing. I think it's important. Um, with that, I'm going to continue reading from this because I think it's important that we all understand, but Interjection noted. So then Manjushri said to Maitreya Bodhisattva, the great one, and to all the other great leaders, good people, in my view, the Buddha, the world honored one, now intends to teach the great Dharma, to send down the reign of the great Dharma, to blow the conscience of the great Dharma, to beat the drum of the great Dharma, and to explain the meaning of the great Dharma. Good people, whenever I have seen this omen from any previous Buddha. After emitting such a beam of light, they have always taught the great Dharma. So you can be sure that this Buddha, having displayed this light, similarly intends to lead all beings to hear and understand the Dharma that everyone in the world finds so hard to believe. That is why he displayed this omen. Good people. A long time ago, innumerable, unlimited, inconceivable, countless eons ago, there was a Buddha named Sun and Moon Light Tathagata, one worthy of offerings, truly awakened, fully clear in conduct, well gone, understanding the world, unexcelled leader, trainer of men, teacher of heavenly beings and people, Buddha and world honored one. He preached the true Dharma in a way that was good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. A Dharma that is profound in meaning and whose words are skillful and wonderful, pure 
and unadulterated, perfect, flawless, and characteristic of noble practices. For those who sought to be Shravakas, he taught the Dharma of the Four Truths for overcoming birth, old age, disease, and death, and for attaining nirvana. For those who sought to be Pratyaka Buddhas, he taught the Dharma of the Twelve Causes and Conditions, the Nidana. And for the Bodhisattvas, he taught the Six Transcendental Practices to lead them to attain Supreme Awakening and All-Inclusive Wisdom. Then there was another Buddha, also named Sun and Moonlight, and yet another Buddha, also named sun and moon light and similarly there were 20,000 buddhas all of which had the same name sun and moon light and all of them with the same surname as well Bharadvaja. you should know maitreya that all these buddhas who from the first to the last had the same name sun and moon light were worthy of the ten epithets of a Buddha and taught the Dharma in a way that was good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Before the last of these Buddhas had left his home, he had eight royal sons. The first was named Having Intention, the second Good Intention, the third Infinite Intention, the fourth Precious Intention, the fifth Increasing Intention, the sixth undoubting intention the seventh resounding intention and the eighth eighth dharma intention is it becoming clear that these aren't actual people but mental states keep that in mind <laughs> no pun intended <laughs> that's funny these eight princes were independently dignified and virtuous, each ruling over four great realms. All these princes, hearing that their father had left his home and attained supreme awakening, renounced their royal positions and followed him and left home, with their minds on the great vehicle, and always observing noble practices, and having already planted roots of goodness under tens of millions of Buddhas, all of them became Dharma teachers. At that time, the Buddha Sun and Moon Light taught the Great Vehicle Sutra called Innumerable Meanings, a Dharma by which Bodhisattvas are taught and which Buddhas watch over and keep in mind. As soon as he had taught this sutra, he sat cross-legged in the midst of the Great Assembly and entered the kind of concentration called the Place of Innumerable Meanings, Samadhi in which his body and mind were motionless. At this moment, Mandarava, Great Mandarava, Manjushaka, and Great Manjushaka, flowers, rained down from the sky over the Buddha, and the whole great assembly, what did it do? While the whole Buddha world trembled in six different ways. Then the congregation, the monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, gods, dragons, satyrs, the whole bunch, as well as minor kings, having obtained something that they had never had before, put their palms together in joy and in rapt attention, looked up to the Buddha. Remember what I said all of this is about? Attention! <laughs> then... From the characteristic tuft of white hair between his brows, the Tathagata emitted a beam of light that illuminated 18,000 Buddha lands to the east so that it extended throughout. We're still on the same detail. You know what you get? <laughs> this, is, this is silly, but this tuft of light thing. You know what we do in our modern culture that kind of reminds me of it? You ever seen anyone go... <laughs> okay, this is like, prepare to have your mind blown. <laughs> I'm not making fun of it. I'm trying to remake it relatable. That's what's going on here. Maitreya, you should have understood, or you should understand, that in the congregation at that time, there were two billion bodhisattvas who happily wanted to hear the Dharma, 
all these bodhisattvas seeing this beam of light illuminating all those Buddha lands and obtaining what they had never had before wanted to know the causes and circumstances of that light. At that time, there was a bodhisattva named Wonderful Light who had 800 disciples. When sun and moonlight Buddha arose from concentration, because of Wonderful Light Bodhisattva, he taught the Great Vehicle Sutra called the Lotus Flower of the Wonderful Dharma, by which bodhisattvas are taught and which Buddhas watch over and keep in mind. For 60 small eons, he remained seated without getting up. During those 60 small eons, the listeners in that congregation also stayed seated in their places, motionless in body and mind, listening to the Buddha's preaching as if it took no longer than a meal. During that time, no one in the congregation felt at all weary, either in body or in mind. So with that in mind, I'm going to take a break, and we're really going to hit the ground running when uh, in the next part, because I did a lot of preparatory talking here. But here we are. We're in the introduction. And after all of the fanfare, and you got to pay attention, this is meaningful to everybody, and it's going to blow your mind. We're going to teach the Great Vehicle Sutra. And even though it's going to take a while, he's already telling you there's a lot of information here. And yes, we're going to be repetitive. But it's so amazing, there's little chance you'll get bored, and it'll seem like it just took no time at all. <laughs> I don't know if I can make the same claim, but I'm going to give it a shot, okay? In the meantime, please be well. Take care of your health. Pay attention to everything. Read, study. Be happy. <laughs> I love you folks. And uh, if you can, if you can, please check out my Patreon site. I need your support. I'll keep doing this as long as I have a functional computer and an internet connection, okay? Please take care. Have a wonderful time. I can't wait till the next video. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.